Good morning. I'm grateful that we can have a, this grand round presented by the Patient Support Program. I'm also grateful that today we can consider the research aspects of vision rehabilitation. Under the direction of Dr. Olson and Dr. Ord, an excellent patient support program has been developed to provide assistance for patients in need when the outstanding clinical team has already provided the diagnosis and treatments which they can. Of course, this recognizes the excellent and advanced care provided here at the Moran by optometrists, ophthalmologists, specialist ophthalmologists, and subspecialists. My gratitude to all of you who care for those, who give the care which is given, and I'm grateful for the privilege of working with you. Today, we are privileged to have Dr. Donald C. Fletcher with us. I am confident knowing Don that he would prefer this introduction to be, hi, everybody, this is Don but I do feel that a more formal introduction is necessary. Don is originally from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. He has done more than anyone else I know in regards to the clinical research regarding vision rehabilitation. Don received his bachelor's degree at the University of Alberta with first standing honors. The Dean's honor roll, he also received his doctor of medicine at the University of Alberta. His ophthalmology residency was at the University Hospital in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. A retinal vitreous fellowship was completed with Dr. William E. Jackson at the Presbyterian Medical Center in Denver, and a low vision rehabilitation fellowship was completed with Dr. August Kohlenbrander at Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco with additional training with Dr. Eleanor Fay at the Lighthouse in New York. Dr. Kohlenbrander and Dr. Fay are world recognized as being pioneers in vision rehabilitation, and Don joins them in being recognized as a true pioneer in the field. Don has received the Distinguished Alumni Award from the University of Alberta, the Secretariat Award, and the Senior Achievement Award from the Academy. He's a clinical associate professor at the University of Kansas and adjunct associate clinical scientist at the Skeffens Eye Research Institute. He is a reviewer for ophthalmology, for archives, and the BJO. He has completed 17 international volunteer missions, has trained 25 US and international fellows, has brought four vision rehab products to market, has three current NIH grants, 19 completed supported projects, 79 publications, and over 200 presentations. I am personally grateful that Don has been an associate instructor in my class at the Academy for many years. While in San Francisco, Don became very concerned about addiction recovery and has remarked on an additional, embarked on an additional career in addiction recovery medicine. Don has completed an addiction medicine fellowship in 2018 and 2019, and now he has a DAX waiver, DEA X waiver for 100 addition, addiction treatment patients. I always enjoy listening to Don speak and appreciate his ex exceptional understanding of the subject he will be discussing today, retinal adjustments in the presence of foveal scotomas. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Here's Don. We will be monitoring the chat. If you have any questions, please send them in if you're on Zoom and we'll be bring them up in the course of the conversation. Great. I have lots of material that I can talk about with you today, but I'm anxious to interact and have any questions that are brought up uh, discussed as they come up because we don't have to cover everything that I've got on today. Thanks, Bob, very much. Bob's a long-term friend and um, it's, it's always fun to be here in Utah. I've, uh, two kids live in Draper, actually, and, and so that uh, always draws me close here. And I, I work at an addiction medicine clinic uh, in Murray a um, uh, few days every month. I did that, that fellowship. So that's my new hobby is addiction medicine and, and treating opioid addiction. But I have spent 35 years uh, doing low vision rehabilitation, and I counted up somewhere between 30 to 35,000 patients I've seen now in, as low vision patients. After doing the retina fellowship, it became the the whole focus of my career. I, I didn't do retinal surgery after the uh, first year of, of finishing my fellowship, but I fell in love with uh, vision rehabilitation. And, and my whole research and most of what I've done has been uh, looking at retinal pathology and correlating function with pathology. So I've done a lot of research with scanning laser ophthalmoscope and I hope I can share some interesting little tidbits as we go um, along here. So that advance is good. Uh, I wish I had more financial disclosures, but I do have two little tests that I came up with, a California Center of Vision Field Test and a Smith Kettlewell Reading Test, which I'll be talking about today, which I do get a commission from. So I better, 
uh, note that, although I don't have uh, bricks and bricks of gold from that by any means. Okay, I'm gonna tell you my take home messages now and I'll tell you again and again, and this is hopefully some important things that we're gonna to cover today. The visual system has some remarkable mechanisms for adaptation to disease and damage. Rehabilitation can assist the visual system and the human being to adapt. There's more to vision than visual acuity. I just hate it when presentations say, the vision was 20 whatever. No, that is the acuity. And there's a lot more to vision than just acuity. So that's one of my little hobby horses that I get on. Ophthalmology does not stop at the level of the retina. Each eyeball belongs to a person. Don't forget to refer for low vision rehabilitation in your, in your clinical practice. Okay. My first day of ophthalmology residency um, was probably like many of yours. The chief resident took me around to tour me on the facilities. And the last stop on the tour was the low vision clinic. He said, this is misnamed. It should be the slow vision. He said, this is the most boring, awful, cruel and unusual punishment given to residents to have to spend time in the low vision clinic. He really thought it was awful. So that was his uh, image of it. He suggested that a, a reclining chair, as noted there, should be used for the ophthalmologist because it's so boring that you're liable to fall off a three-legged stool kind of thing and hurt yourself if you don't have a reclining chair. So the patients and the doctors all sleep during it. Well, that was my introduction, and I do not think that's the nature of low vision rehab. I would actually propose that it's an exciting, rewarding, challenging, stimulating, wonderful, absolutely fantastic area of ophthalmology. So it is certainly one that... Um, is still very young and, and developing. Um, I, I work for the uh, Helen Keller Foundation and uh, I, I have great respect for that wonderful woman. And she said, among other things, life is either a daring adventure or nothing. And that goes for all of us, including the visually impaired and blind. So again, low vision rehabilitation is more than magnification. And that's the way often we're introduced to it. And that slow vision clinic at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, Canada, uh, was pretty boring because all they had was magnifiers. It was pretty slow. When I was doing my retinal fellowship, I can very distinctly remember the great emphasis that was placed on finding all the holes. There's no sense doing a scleral buckle and only getting six out of the seven holes. You're not going to have a very good success rate if you do that. So you want to support and buckle all the holes, address them all. With low vision rehab, there's holes in people's lives scotomas in their vision. And if you don't address all of them, you're not gonna have the biggest success. Uh, at Moorfields, great eye center in, in London, uh, Humphrey and Thompson did a study several years ago at their low vision clinic and found that after one year post prescribing of their magnifier, 77% were not being used at all. They were in the drawer gathering dust. And that's a rather discouraging statistic if you're just looking at magnification. But if you have a traditional kind of low vision clinic where you measure acuity, calculate the resolution deficit, show the person a few magnifiers, sell them a magnifier and never see them again, to me, it's not surprising that 77% of them are not going to be used. Because with retinal pathology, with macular scotomas, even using a magnifier takes a tremendous amount of practice. And there's a lot more to life than just using a magnifier too. So my approach would be to approach low vision rehabilitation the same way we do in orthopedics or neurology. Uh, where you have a team approach and the patient is part of that team. So in low vision rehabilitation, you need to develop an understanding in the patient of their residual visual capacity and then help them develop compensatory skills, drill for skill kind of mentality. And that's what happens in other areas of medicine. Why not in vision rehabilitation? So look, story here, anecdotally of, of uh, Larry here. Um, he lived in Lawrence, Kansas. He was a KU fan and uh, he was <clears throat> a bowler and had macular degeneration and had uh, around 2200 acuity, something like that. So you'll see in his hand there, a little magnifier in his little bowling jersey kind of thing. He's at the scoring machine. He was really excited to get that magnifier because it enabled him to push the buttons. And this was for automated you know, uh, um, bowling alleys. And so he was the scorekeeper. He'd put in the numbers and pins and so on like that. And he was just delighted that his magnifier allowed him to, to do that. His occupational therapist said, well, well, aren't you bowling? He says, no, I can't bowl. I'm legally blind. I'm 2200 acuity. Uh, no, you can bowl. And she had to go to the bowling alley with him and bowl a few times to prove to him. But to make a long story short, yes, keeping the score was great, but he actually got quite good at bowling. He was quite a... Um, 
a funny guy, and he, he wanted to get a white cane from our orientation mobility specialist. And we said, well, you don't have a lot of mobility problems. You know, why do you want a white cane? He says, just for the psychological advantage it'll have over my opponents when I'm bowling, is if I tap my way in with a white cane and then put it down and throw a strike, it's just going to demoralize them, you know? They won't have a chance. So he won the league that first year, actually. He really is a, a good bowler. So again, there's more to vision rehabilitation than just that little magnifier that he had in his hand. So it's a team approach. And these are just some of the team members that I've uh, worked with doing some of the various things that I think are important to comprehensive low vision rehabilitation. So a little study that we did, um, this was actually when I was in Missouri, Kansas City. <clears throat> I'm at KU now, the Crosstown um, rival. Um, but um, we looked at uh, about 220 patients and their goal accomplishment. And remember in the Humphrey and Thompson study, I said that 77% of magnifiers weren't used. Well, when we went a year back, a year later after discharge of our patients, 75% were actively using their magnifier daily kind of thing. And only three had given up and said it was unsuccessful. But 20% were using it, you know, intermittently, spot reading perhaps. But that's the exact, you know, flip side of what the Moorefields Eye experience was. And this is giving patients an average of about five hours of training. So, you know, in your low vision clinic where you just sell the magnifier and send them on their way, they're not getting that experience with how to maneuver around their central scotomas and so on. Other goals, meal preparation, self-care, handwriting, shopping, so on and so on. Overall, about 80% accomplishment of the goals that the people set. So I think that's pretty significant. And uh, making a real world change in the lives of these people. <clears throat> so that was kind of macro level. Let's go down to micro level now. What happens when the fovea doesn't work? You know, it's interesting that I went through medical school, ophthalmology residency, and a retinal fellowship and nobody ever mentioned or thought about, did I ever hear any concern about what happens when, you know, you get a macular scar that encompasses the fovea? What does the eye do? I don't remember any dialogue at any point ever about that. And that is really important. If you don't have a functioning fovea, how do you function? You know, your textbooks will often have a little black hole floating around in the middle of the picture. Nobody will describe that. That just does not happen. The world does not look like that to the, the patients. Our eyes are very good. Our brains are very good at perceptual completion. So this is this triangle, you remember, where the inside becomes the outside. And you have real difficulty making a perceptual completion of that because it doesn't make sense when one side's the inside, one side's the outside. But one of the amazing things with this little optic illusion, I've put little gaps in there and you don't have any problem completing the edges of the triangle across those gaps because you're able to draw in the missing pieces and thus people with macular scotomas are able to do that too. And they fill in the missing pieces with what they think should be there. So patients uh, don't see their field defects. Remember, the brain is all the seeing, not just the eyeball. Okay, this is an optical illusion that I really quite like. I want you to really stare with as much concentration as you can at the lacrosse, okay? On this picture, there are only 12 pink dots and one dot in sequence goes out. But if you stare at that X, that cross in the middle, you'll see green suddenly appearing. The missing dot becomes green. And if you hold your eye real steady, the pink totally disappears and you've got only a green dot going around in a circle. So <clears throat> that's you know, a visual uh, perception as when a way you can fool it. The after image opposite of um, pink is green and uh, you know, if you don't move your eye, you do have extinction of uh, phenomena. So one of the th adaptations to this, to see what's really there, is to keep your eye moving. When, you're, when you don't move, you don't see accurately. When you don't move your eye with a macular scotoma, you don't see accurately either. And the, the main function that I have to do as a vision rehabilitation professional is teach people how to move their eyes. Because that scotoma becomes negligible when you are, you know, constantly moving it around. Your brain does a, a completion of the, the overall picture. To accomplish that, <clears throat> the visual system use, uses something called a preferred retinal locus. Plural would be loci, preferred retinal loci. So in an eye with a central scotoma affecting, one, affecting all of the fovea, the development of one or more eccentric PRLs, or preferred retinal loci, naturally and reliably occurs. Just by a quick show of hand, how many of you are familiar with the term 
PRL, preferred retinal locus. I, it's not one that we talk about a lot. It's really important. You know, when you lose the fovea, where is the center of the person's visual space? It's at the PRL and they will develop an oculocentric reference point. And up, down, right, and left is not based on the fovea. So when you have them look at an Amsler grid, they do not ever look at the Amsler grid with the dead fovea and stick it in the middle of the Amsler grid. They use the PRL, the preferred retinal locus. So if you're trying to interpret an Amsler grid, you know, you can't assume that the fovea is aiming at the center of the Amsler grid. It's not. And the visual system's ability to fill in Amsler grids is remarkable. So Amsler grid, in my mind, isn't worth paper it's printed on. But anyway, that's just my a little aside on that. <clears throat> so this is an example of a PRL. You've got a macular scar right in the center. And let's say the PRL in this case is anatomically inferior uh, to that macular scar. The person would rotate their eye down, which then pushes that PRL up into alignment with the tree. So they're trying to see the tree. That's actually the least common way that it goes. The most common is actually up. So the, the most common spot for PRL when you have a, a relatively round uh, macular scar is up. And most people move their scotoma up. It's of best functional significance that way because we don't do that much up there, but we do lots down here. You walk down here, use your hands down here, you read down here. So there's a, a strong drive to push the scotoma up instead of down. So you're saying the scotoma for the defect is PRL is on the retina is inferior to the retina? No, this, that example it was, but that's actually the opposite of what is the most common scenario. About 40% um, of people put the uh, PRL anatomically superior and about 10% put it anatomically inferior. And then the rest is split between right and left. So about 25 uh, right, 25 left, 40 superior and 10 inferior. And there's a lot of different factors that go into that. What's binocular correspondence and um, what's the least amount of uh, linear distance between the fovea, the dead fovea and PRL. So if you have an oblong one where you have a lot more of the scotoma anatomically superior, then you might put it inferior. Is, it, is this obvious enough that, that the examiner will see the person? It has to be it has to be almost 15 degrees of eccentricity before the examiner will notice it. I can I'm good, so I can do it at maybe eight, nine degrees, but not with less than five degrees. Like you, you really can't appreciate it. So the patient comes in and they're looking at my forehead. They've got a, they've got a fairly big eccentric viewing angle. If they're looking at your forehead, they've probably got a 15 degree eccentricity. In monkeys that have their phobias, did, did you, that, that wasn't hurt. Okay. Question is, how long does it take to develop a PRL? Um, I think one of the best studies was in um, ablating monkey phobias, and it took a matter of weeks to really develop a good PRL. Um, when I watch a <clears throat> um, fairly rapid onset of um, an exuded maculopathy that, that lose, makes fovea function lose. It's just weeks. You, you'll do this, not months, but weeks. You'll develop a pretty good stable PRL. So the, it doesn't take long. Um, and it's rudimentary quick, and then it stabilizes and becomes more functionally effective in, in a matter of weeks. There was another question here, yeah? Well, there's a similar kind of mechanism. Sorry, the question is, is this uh, analogous to anomalous retinal correspondence? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the brain has the ability to put attention on different areas. And so, uh, you know, there's a, a number of um, strabismic and, and uh, different situations that, that uh, can give you something similar. Um, in ROP with, you know, drag discs and so on, um, you may have the fovea there, but you'll have you know uh, an angle cap or whatever because of the physical of it, uh, pull of it. But you know there's um, a lot of situations where you can develop anomalous correspondence. It happens in a lot of macular scars where they're uneven sized. Um, it's it's amazing how the visual system can kind of calibrate so that you don't see double. I've had out of that 35,000 patients I've seen that are low vision. Um, probably, you know, 70% of them don't have a functioning uh, fovea. And I've only had maybe six or seven cases of diplopia where people have PRLs that don't match up with each other. 
Uh, the visual system does a pretty good job of, of working along that and, and, and making your retinal areas coincide. Not anomalous retinal correspondence be similar. Uh, there's, there's a follow-up question. Do people develop a TRL in unilateral vision? Yes. If they, wait a second. <laughs> the better eye, yes. The lesser eye, not necessarily. If you have a big macular scar in one eye and a functioning fovea in the other eye, you probably won't develop a very good PRL in the lesser eye with the big scotoma. But when you do a, an SLO study and you put up a stimulus, you'll, you'll see a pattern of where they go to look at it. Even though it may not be a very stable one, there, there'll be some rudimentary evidence that there is uh, the start of a PRL at a given um, eccentric angle, uh, but it won't be very good if the better eye as a functioning fovea. Could you explain for a moment what an SLO is and how it works? I'm going to come to that in a few slides. Scanning laser ophthalmoscope, where you do visual field tests on the retina instead of in a perimeter bowl or whatever. So this guy has an anatomically superior PRL, and he's looking at your forehead, and that's you know about 15 degrees of eccentricity. And you can see he's looking at the photographer's forehead. This is a scanning laser ophthalmoscope. Um, they were uh, invented uh, at Scapes Irish Institute in Boston, um, probably um, early 80s, 1980s. And what it simply does is gives you an image of um, the retina and lets you project stimuli onto it. And you can have the person responding in real time to what's happening on the retina. The California Center Visual Field Test is my cheap way of doing a visual field test with a laser pointer and, and that's where I get the, the commission. And so I, on everybody, I, if I have an SLO available, I use the SLO. If I don't, I do the CCVFT with the laser pointer test. But here's um, an SLO image of a person with a macular scar. And we've asked them to look at the cross and the fovea is somewhere within that macular scar. And this person is using anatomically temporal retina and they're moving that um, scotoma uh, to the right. So it's a right eccentric viewing position. And that um, is uh, the adaptation for the development of the PRL is move the eye right. The downside of that is, of course, that the next word is in when you're trying to read is always in that blind spot. So it's a real pain to have right-sided scotomas. Now, here's the perimetry that we did. Green dots are seen, red dots are not seen. So you can see that macular scar is pretty dead. So it doesn't appreciate any very, very bright lights even. It's a very dense scotoma. Now, interestingly, here's the fellow eye. And this one has a superior EVP, a superior extended viewing position, a superior anatomically superior PRL. And this person actually did experience diplopia. It's one of those seven or eight people that experienced diplopia because they were both about equal quality PRLs and they weren't going in the same direction. And he had diplopia. There's the uh, perimetry on, on his eye. Okay, so training with respect to those PRLs. The PRLs naturally and reliably occur, but the skill in using them is acquired. Patients are not aware often of the relationship of their PRLs to the macular scars and the scotomas. So they'll naturally develop an ability to use the PRL to look at whatever they wanna look at, your face, you know, navigating around the room, using a magnifier and reading, they'll pretty on their own naturally get good at aligning the PRL with the object of regard, but they'll be totally oblivious to where the scotomas are around them. Um, and when we train them uh, to become more effective readers, we're really looking at uh, increasing their awareness of where the scotomas are so they can make compensatory eye movements and a deliberate scanning strategy and also hand-eye coordination, because that all gets messed up when you move your eye like to the right or up. Your pen doesn't go down where your PRL is pointing. It tends to go down where your um, old fovea is pointing. I'll show you some examples of that. So this is a study that um, I did with Ron Shukar, one of my major collaborators, um, looking at the error rate when reading pre and post training. And so um, pre-training with the best magnifiers for the person's problem, um, people were making about one error every uh, 25 words. And post-training, it was one error every 89 words. That's quite significant. That amount of accuracy is, is, a, is a big improvement. Now, here's um, an interesting case when I was talking about hand-eye 
a coordination that will be an example of this. The PRL in this individual is also in temporal retina. It takes a right eccentric viewing position, a movement of the eye to the right to align up the PRL with the object of regard. So if they're looking at you, Lisa, they'd actually be looking over here. And you'd think, is this person not you know, looking at me? Why are they trying to avoid my gaze? So right eye movement. Now, uh, the occupational therapist asked this person, just as a training exercise, to find all the letters of the alphabet and use the red felt pen to cross out the letters. Just look for the A and the B and the C and everything. And you'll notice, is this working? All right. They missed the A and knocked out the next letter. They made a mistake to the right. The C, a little bit off center. The D, yeah, D was again over to the right. E was to the right. F, they were way off to the right. And so on. Why are they making mistakes to the right? Because that's where the fovea is pointing. And there's a well-established neuromuscular memory of your little rectus muscles aim the eye over here, and that's where your hand goes, you know? So uh, the hand-eye coordination has to be rewritten, and uh, this is part of the training. And it's a software. It can be written. There's nothing hardwired there. But it's a really common mistake. So here's another example. The PRL in this individual is nasal to a scar, and this requires a left eccentric viewing position to get the PRL in, in alignment with uh, the object of regard. Sorry, could you go back to that slide for just a moment? Which one, this one? Yeah, I find it very interesting that the PRL has sort of nestled itself inside of that atrophic scar. Yeah, there's probably, this mouse doesn't work here, does it? Oh, there it does, okay, I got it working. Okay, so if the fovea is, you know, two and a half disc diameters over, the fovea should be around here. And this is definitely dense scotoma here, but this is relative scotoma here. So the PRL was kind of in relative scotoma. The highest resolution, the, the smallest linear distance between the fovea and a functioning area is right here. So that's probably why they chose the PRL there. It's never good to sandwich the PRL between, you know, the scar and the disc, but um, generally the first driving factor to PRL location is where's the highest resolution. And then they go into other concerns. If it's round, then they go up. But if it's oblong like this, then they'll go to where the highest resolution is. And so I'm assuming the highest resolution, you know, was in this area here. So that put this bulk of the scotoma to the left-hand side. And there, there definitely was some eccentricity because the phobia here, the PRL, you know, was at least five degrees off center. Okay, you bet. So in this exercise, the occupational therapist wanted the person to find all these words, head, boy, girl, clock, hat, in, book, and so on. Take the red felt pen and draw a circle around, H-E-A-D. And if you look, there's a consistent pattern of overshooting to the left. So the F gets included with head, the head. And um, it's girl includes the K on that left-hand side. So they're always going over there to the, the left and, and uh, making an offshoot where the fovea is um, pointing. Now, here's an interesting one. We do a lot of line tracing with this hand-eye coordination stuff. So the person is supposed to trace the triangles and the top image is the person's first attempt at doing it, no, no training. This is the person with that left eccentric viewing position. So if you look at them starting on this corner here, they put the pen down here where the fovea is pointing over there to the left and then went around and, and did their little drawing. Pretty consistently, a lot of overshoots to the left. After two weeks of practice, we give them homework and have them take it home. Look at right on. No improvement in acuity. That's just a neuromuscular, you know, and eye coordination skill that uh, can be improved. And that has a lot of benefits for real world activities, handwriting being one of them. So, yeah, I mean, here's real world there's uh, the check pre and the check post. Now, we also gave them the felt tip pen, which is a little bit bolder stroke and some bold lines you know, checks and so on, which make it easier also, but that check's quite readable and they're staying on the line and they were not staying on the line, you know, before they had that training. That's functionally significant. Okay, lessons from the scanning laser ophthalmoscope, as I alluded to earlier, don't trust the Amsler grid. When I've had an Amsler grid projected onto my optic nerve, I didn't see anything missing. All the lines were there and I had to have the picture taken and geez, that was on my optic nerve. My brain's very capable of guessing where those lines are going and filling in across it. And with, with Ron Shukard, we found that um, if the scotoma is less than five degrees in diameter, 
the absolute grid doesn't pick up 80% of them. So anything less than five degrees, the absolute grid is useless, basically. If it's big, that's fine, but you're not gonna know where the fovea is, where the PRL is from an absolute grid either. And um, the absolute grid is, is used because it makes retinal doctors feel good about being able to do something with their patients when they can't do anything else. I really find that an annoying test. Okay, so here's a scanning laser ophthalmoscope study. Sorry, question, yeah? Does the AMSR have any utility? Very little, in my opinion. And we put far too much confidence in it. The metamorphopsy that people experience looking at door jams or curtain edges or something like that, I think are every good, it's good, probably better than the AMSR grid. Um, if you have a sudden exudation and a change in the scotoma pattern, then you'll pick it up on the AMSR. But if it's small and subtle, it won't be appreciated. It has to be something pretty major um, in, in my experience uh, for the answer to pick it up. So you're saying that we should preferably ask people if bench posts are crooked, if door jams are crooked, and the, then come see the, the key is doing it monocularly, because when you're doing something binocularly, you're not going to pick up on a change in, in one eye. So do one eye, do the other eye, look at a door jam or look at the AMS or whatever. That, that's fine to do it. Make sure you have them do it monocularly though, not just looking at it binocularly. And I, I think the door jam or the, the lines on the curtains back there or whatever are as good as the amateur grid, but just have them do it monocularly. If you have the amateur stuck on a magnet the refrigerator, I guess that's not a bad idea. Just think of it every time they go to the refrigerator to get their you know, goodies, they, they can look at the amateur and that's maybe not a, a bad idea, but it's, we have far too much confidence in it. Okay, we have a scanning laser thermoscope image here of a person. Um, the PRL is noted there in the center. That's the fixation point at the fovea. And they have a DS, dense scotoma, pretty much surrounding fixation, so a ring scotoma. And in patients that come to um, a low vision clinic, somewhere between 16 to 20% have this pattern uh, of macular degeneration patients coming for, for vision rehab. John, while you're on that, can you yeah. stop for a moment? Could you go back to that slide? Mm -hmm. So I, I've always supposed that when we use magnification and make an image larger in a ring scotoma, that makes it more difficult for the patient. Would you agree? Depends how big the central island is. So in this patient, they have a pretty big central island. That's probably you know three degrees across. So they can they can deal with a fair amount of magnification. I've got an image here of um, words on a ring scotoma, and that'll give you some appreciation of how big a magnified word is. So let me bring that up. Okay. So I did a study in 1997, looking at 1300 eyes doing macular primary studies on them. And 16% of that study had ring scotomas. So the kind of, you know, configuration you can see down there at the bottom where the uh, island is quite small and a massive big uh, scar. This person may have, you know, 2040 acuity. And I've had many patients come in saying, you know, Dr. X or Y told me that I can drive because I have 2040 acuity and that I shouldn't have any problems because I have good acuity. And they can't do squat because that is such a small island that they've got the 2040 acuity. A single letter acuity does not translate to function in real world activities. There's a heck of a lot of things that are impossible to do with, you know, a one degree island. We have three questions on the chat, John. Yep. Um, uh, Dr. Boyner asked, some prescribed yoga prisms, have they been shown to help with the overshoot issue? No, they've been shown to not help. Yoke prisms, most of the studies, most of the research that has been done in yoke prisms have shown them to be of no particular value. So uh, most of us in the research community are really down on yoke prisms. There's still clinicians that use them, but the data doesn't look good for yoke prisms. Second question, um, Dr. Harry, is having the patient look at the examiner's face more sensitive than the answer? No. Now, face completion is pretty good too. You can have big chunks of the face missing and you can guess what's there. So looking at faces isn't uh, particularly good either. Anything with a, a long straight edge on it, picture on the wall or the door frame or whatever are, are, are you know, pretty good. Dr. Huang has asked, how about the metamorphopsia home monitoring device? 
I don't know it well, but I think it would potentially have some value. I don't, I'm not really, I really haven't used it, but I've, I've heard about that and it, it, it may have some uh, better uh, value than, than an answer would. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I'll have to investigate that further. Yeah, great, good questions, thank you. So this is my California central visual field test with um, a little tiny island in a big ring scotoma. So this, I, I flash a little laser pointer onto a piece of paper and I, I like to do it binocularly because the SLO is, is a monocular test. So I do this in my binocularly. And I just have the patient tap the table when they can see my uh, little uh, light come on, on on that piece of paper. And I can find a, most of the ring scotomas that way. And some of them are very, very large. So this person had a, you know, a big scotoma because each of those rings is five degrees. So that's, that's um, the outer ring there is 15 degrees. So this person had like a 20 degree diameter scotoma with a one degree island in the center of it. And that corresponds to that eye back there. Okay. Now, here's um, an 8M unit size letter projected onto the retina. So if you have a ring scotoma like that and you magnify newsprint eight times, you're going to get two letters in there. So not very many. So when a, a ring scotoma, um, you have to be careful when you magnify more than the real estate available in, in the central area. But what happens if you do magnify that much is the person develops a secondary PRL that's eccentric to the scar. And basically with ring scotomas, I find you give them just a little bit of magnification so it can still fit in that island if it's big enough. And if it isn't big enough, then you go to something like a, a video magnifier, CCTV, and you start dealing with 20 times magnification. And when you make a 20 times magnification, they don't have any choice but to have to go to an eccentric PRL. And they get pretty good at doing that. And that eccentric PRL has the advantage of being able to go horizontally back and forth if it's a superior one, for example, and you don't run into the scotoma. So with ring scotomas, you start with low magnification and lots and lots of light. Lots of light sometimes will expand that central island. If that doesn't work, then you go to high levels of magnification and then try to develop a secondary eccentric PRL. I certainly understand what a ring scotoma is, but sometimes when I'm talking to a patient about a situation like this, I'll say, I'll say it's like having a donut, holding a donut in front of you that you can only see through the hole and the rest of it is black. Absolutely. Or having a lifesaver stuck to your glasses so that wherever <laughs> you look, that lifesaver is surrounding your central spot. Because out here is fine, you know. With, that's with the laser pointer. I like to demonstrate to the patient where they can actually take a hold of the laser pointer and, and geez, look at that. It disappears in there kind of thing. So I can't remember if I put the study in here. Uh, if I come to it later. Um, these scotomas, the central scotomas, even when they're binocular, um, about 55% of people are totally oblivious to them. About 45% of people will say, you know, things disappear occasionally. They'll have some awareness of it. And only about 1% of people will actually be able to see them. And it's only momentarily, fleetingly, when they first look up at the ceiling in the morning, they'll sometimes see the scotoma on the ceiling. But as soon as they start moving, perceptual completion takes over and they don't see them any longer. But they will be aware. I had one lady give me this great story about, you know, I'm aware there's a little blind spot in my eye because a cockroach came out from underneath the refrigerator the other day. And I was trying to step on it. And that darn cockroach ran right into my scotoma. She called it blind spot, you know, but she's, and then it ran on the other side and I could start trying to step on it again. But I thought it was really cute that she had a, an appreciation of her central scotoma because the cockroach hid in it. So here's a scanning laser thermoscope study. And if you look here, this is this green area is the central island. There's a large area of the ring scotoma around it. And then it's green out here again. So it's a ring scotoma. Here is a reading speed versus size plot. This is really large print, and this is smaller. So this is about newsprint, and this is eight times bigger than newsprint. When you look at reading speed versus text size, this is in, in low vision pathognomonic of a ring scotoma. You don't need an SLO when people demonstrate this. This big text here, eight M using size, does not fit in there. It's like that, that word wonderful. Trying to read wonderful here is gonna be really slow if you have you know, only one or two letters at a time. So when you plot that out, these big sizes don't fit in the central island here very well, so they're slower. So when you have a reading speed versus size, slow, fast, then slow again, that's a ring scotoma. So just doing this reading speed, the MN read or the SK read that I do uh, will tell you that. So a reading test is really good for kind of elucidating what type of um, scotoma pattern they have. 
So this is what the MN read is. MN stands for Minnesota. University of Minnesota is where this was developed. Gordon Legg, a colleague of mine, came up with this. Really wonderful, wonderful test. And I'm amazed that in retina practice, we don't use this test more because you learn so much more about the architecture of the macula than you do from single letter acuity, which is only looking at ding, a little tiny spot where you can read one letter at a time. When you look at the pattern that people have when they're reading and the speed that they can read at, you learn a lot about the macula in a real world activity, reading. So, you know, one of the soapboxes I get on and preach all the time, if we're doing research into macular function with whatever drug, whatever laser treatment we're advocating, have them do something besides just single letter acuity. And your end point for success or failure with treatment X or Y should be something more practical like a reading test rather than just single letter acuity. You can tell I have some excitement about that. Okay, if we look back at the MN read here, this block of text right here, they were not able to finish playing the game before dinner, is projected onto the macula here. It's upside down and backwards, but that's print that's five times bigger than newsprint. So that'll give you what might fit into those little central islands. With that central island we were talking about before, you wouldn't want anything more than 5M. Probably 4M would be the most you could do. Maybe even 3M, three times magnification. So M units compared to um, newsprint. So 5M is five times bigger than newsprint. Newsprint is 1M. I can't believe that after all these centuries, we still use Jager notation. Jager was a print uh, in Vienna you know, a gazillion years ago, and the Jager numbers come from his print box. And they're not arithmetic. They don't, a, a J2 is not twice as big as a J1 kind of thing. So it's a stupid, you know, nomenclature that we still hang on to with a lot of our reading cards, Jager units. Uh, M units are far, far better. So M units also subtend, you know, one M subtends uh, five minutes of arc at one meter. So you can, a six, six, uh, is the European way of expressing acuities, six meters and a six M unit uh, um, letter. But anyway, in reading, this is where that M and retest comes in so handy because I look for the last print size that they can read rapidly because there always is a slowdown at a certain point on here. And that's my starting point for magnification. So if, for example, here, the last block they could read rapidly was they were not able to finish playing the game before dinner. And then they started slowing down below that. The last one they could read rapidly is my starting point for magnification. So if their critical print size, the last good reading was 5M, then I give them a 5X magnifier as a starting point. That's just an easy way to figure out where you're, you can use Kestenbaum's formula and on your OCAPs, you're gonna have questions about Kestenbaum's formula, which is dumb, doesn't really work that well. Just using a reading test like that is a far more sensitive way of doing it. This is a test called the SK read test. Sorry, I'm gonna break my arm patting my back. This was a really good idea that I came up with from the MN read. So if you look at the MN read here, this is the 4M block right here. My father asked me to help the two men carry the box inside. I noticed very frequently people with left-sided scotomas, a PRL which put the scotoma to the left of fixation, would mistake that block of text and read to me, my father asked me to help the women carry the box inside. I noticed time and again, the T would be dropped when there was left-sided scotoma. Then, ding, ding, well, hey, why don't I do that on purpose? Because often people won't verbalize their mistakes on the MN read. You'll see them slowing down and they'll look at it, they'll scan back and forth until they get it right and something makes sense. So I developed an MN read test with just jumbled letters and words where it's easy to make a mistake, where your um, letters uh, are um, easy to drop and you still have something that makes sense. You don't have any context to go on. Okay, I got a little bit of time left. So here's some text from my SK read test. It has the same size of print as the MN read. But here's a person with a left-sided scotoma and the typical kind of patterns they make. They thought box was ox and there's no sentence to make them correct it. Two men becoming women still flowed and made sense. But here, there's nothing that makes you want to correct it. So you just go ahead and read the mistakes and don't know you've done anything wrong. After reading that first line, they started on grow and omitted the letter B on that left-hand side. And then uh, they thought um, harm was farm. They substituted an F for an H there. There's, those are all going to tip you off that the main problem area seems to be on the left-hand side. And so when you're looking at the training, what the occupational therapists are going to be doing, the SLO is great, my CCVFT is great, but this is a really good, good way 
of looking at you know, um, the functionally significance of, of a test. Right side of scotoma here, saved became save. Raises became raise. Mad space T became mat. H was dropped on the right-hand side. So again, you can see the pattern there. This person was making mistakes to the right. And sure enough, you know, the SLO showed they did have a right side of mistake. So we compared the MN read and the SK read on 100 consecutive patients. And um, on the SK read, this block of patients had 1,000 errors. And on the MN read, they had 175. So you have 10 times as many errors, which gives you a much better handle on a pattern that you want to see evolving on where the errors are going to be. So the MN read is really good for predicting magnification level, and the SK read is really good for looking at patterns of errors. So anybody that does low vision, I strongly advocate you get an MN read and an SK read. It's great to have an SLO if you've got $50,000. That's wonderful. If you don't, get these two tests, and you can get a lot of really practical information for a couple hundred bucks. And so this is the poor man's SLO. And it's actually, the SLO is nice, mainly for academic interest, looking at you know, macular patterns of, of adaptation. But this is real world, this is reading. That's what our major goal is for people that have low vision. Okay, I, again, I alluded to this earlier. Using the CCVFT, uh, the, the laser pointer test, 88% um, of my patients in a low vision clinic demonstrated binocular scotoma. So that's a lot of people that are having to dodge scotomas in a low vision clinic. And 66% had a binocular dense scotoma. And only 56% had and uh, uh, sorry, 56% uh, had a totally were oblivious to the fact they had a scotoma. Sometimes they were as large as 30 degree diameter. Scotoma, what do you, I, mean, I didn't use the word scotoma, a blind spot. I don't know about any blind spots. It's amazing how good the visual system is at adapting. But it's important that the patient know about it because they're going to have functional implications of that. Their reading is going to be really difficult if they don't know how to move that scotoma out of the way. If we look at the people, that were aware versus those that were unaware, the people in my initial study that were aware of it had a much higher reading rate than those that were not aware of their scotomas before any rehabilitation, before any treatment. One last visual field test that I think is kind of fun, it's a dynamic visual field test. This is an idea that Ron Schuchert and I came up with that <clears throat> I think has a lot of, again, functional significance for living with scotomas, you know. <clears throat> In this test, fixation is discouraged. Move your eyes around wherever you want. There's no you know, central fixation point you got to stay steady on. Move. We want you to move. Any central uh, stimulus on the test is just for reference, not for fixation. And when we put a stimulus up, we take away the central fixation point. The stimulus patient stays up until the patient identifies it. And your outcome measure is the reaction time, not whether or not they saw it, because you leave it up until they see it. So. Here, for example, is the central fixation point, and then we present land C, and we wait until they say right. So they are allowed to move the time around, and we look at how long it takes them to find it and respond to it. Next stimulus, we got to wait until they see it and they say up. Next one, they say down, and you go all around the visual field doing that. So you have a plot like that, and then you can put it on a grayscale. So <clears throat> on the SLO, I know that this person has you know, a, a, a field defect to the right of fixation, a right extended viewing position. And it's interesting, that's where the reaction times are the slowest. So the, the, scotoma, the, the stimulus will sit in that scotoma, and the patient doesn't see it, and then they think, hmm, it's been a while, I've heard the beep, maybe I should look for it, and then they look for it. And so that latency is what you're looking at here. And this really improves with training. So this is kind of an endpoint of whether our therapists are doing a good job and the patient is getting an appreciation. Don, yeah. Dr. Olson asked, so many patients who do not recognize their scotoma, which they understand is focus problem. This get me better glasses and denial at the actual visual loss. Absolutely, totally accurate. That's what they say. I have a focusing problem. I'm not, I can't focus my eye right. And it's aiming their eye, not focusing it. They just have to aim their eye and position it more accurately onto the PRO instead of some other area that's not as good. Yeah. So how do you handle that question in clinical situations? Well, that's, that's a big part of the education in your initial visit is showing them where the scotomas are. So when they indicate that, I said, yes, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to focusing later and we'll look at spectacles later 
Right now, I want to start out with looking at your visual field here, because this is usually the cause of what you're describing, the problem that you're describing, is some blind spots in your central field, as opposed to a focusing problem. So many of my patients complain about not being able to recognize faces. Do you have a, 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 an easy answer for them? That's the first um, symptom of macular degeneration. I think that before anybody has any reading difficulty, they have difficulty recognizing faces. That's more a contrast issue. So as you lose contrast sensitivity, facial features become blurred. So you can tell there's people there, but you can't tell there's Tom or Dick over there waving at me kind of thing. So a really common uh, problem. It's tied in with all aspects of vision loss, <clears throat> decreased resolution, um, scotomas. Main thing I think is contrast sensitivity, but <clears throat> that's a hard one to improve too. I tell them, you, know, you, you got to put your pride in your back pocket and tell all your friends you got a vision problem because otherwise they'll think you're snobby. They didn't smile at me today when you walk by, Don. How come? What's the matter? You got your nose in the air? And I'm sorry, I didn't see you because very subtle little clues like a brow wink. When you see somebody you know, you raise your eyebrows. And when you're low vision, you don't see that little raising of your eyebrows. And if you look at somebody and raise your eyebrows like that and they don't do it back to you, that's cold. It's icy. So it's, it's, um, <clears throat> very socially significant face recognition. And so it's really important that low vision patients, could I have more picture? All right, um, I have to go up here, screen one out, that they know that <clears throat> other people should know about their vision problem and say, hey, hey, Bob, it's Don, you know, when you walk up to them, because face recognition is almost universally a problem with everybody that comes to our clinic, right? Right. Yeah, okay. So there's the dynamic visual field test. Here's my central uh, tangent visual field test. And this solo was quite similar. Okay. So awareness of central field disruption facilitates more deliberate scanning strategies to make navigate and compensate for visual field problems. Again, I want to, you can, you can tell I'm excited about this, passionate. Acuity doesn't tell the whole story. So in any kind of research you're doing, use more than just acuity. My take home messages, the visual system has some remarkable mechanisms for adaptation to disease and damage. Rehabilitation can assist the visual system and the human being to adapt. There's more to vision than visual acuity. Ophthalmology doesn't stop at the level of the retina. Each eyeball belongs to a person. Don't forget to refer to low vision rehabilitation. So thanks for your attention. And I've got a little bit of time for questions if anybody's got any here. What is the, what would you say for the comprehensive ophthalmologist who's watch, watching today on Zoom as the, 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 the take home message for them is to see somebody with cancer? Um, I think one of the things that all ophthalmologists should, should do, and it doesn't take a lot of time, while you're doing your history, ask a few functional questions. Because the people with ring scotomas are gonna have good acuity and they're gonna have a lot of functional problems. So. Um, I mean, something as simple as, do you have difficulty reading? You know, a, a screening question is a, is a great starting point for a full for low vision rehab, because you, you can make assumptions uh, and get into really trouble, assuming on the basis of acuity that people do or don't have problems. So just ask, do you have trouble reading? You know, with your glasses on, do you have trouble reading? And if they do, then you need to think, well, maybe we have some pathology here that I'm not recognizing, maybe a low vision referral isn't appropriate. Um, general ophthalmologists, um, I think, are very fine to remember that ads don't stop at three. Uh, it's okay sometimes to give a four or five ad to some some people. That's that's all right. Um, what else would you say? You you answer the one question. Help me. What else would you say to general ophthalmologists? I think the point about a plus four and a plus five in an ad is very good. So the question from Dr. Shortkopf is: Are there commercially available training programs to help patients use their PRL? Yes, um, there, there are some, they're, they're available through the American Occupational Therapy Association. Um, and my OTs are the ones that developed it. Um, there's, it well, there's, a, there's a really good one actually, um, that I think probably uh, Precision Vision carries. Uh, so you can get it through Precision Vision, which sells our EDTRS charts of that too. Learning to use your vision for reading. Lover, L-U-V, um, are learn to use your vision for reading. Um, and that's, that's a really good training book for, for uh, teaching a person to read. 
Um, Mary Warren's got a few other ones out that are, that are sold through the American Occupational Therapy Association. But Gail Watson did the Lover book, and that's a really good one, L-U-V-R, Learn to Use Your Vision for Reading. And I believe that Precision Vision sells that. Good question. Yes. That, that was the last one, yeah. Learning to use your vision for reading, yeah. Sorry, yeah, question? Well, the first key was getting reimbursement for it. So I'll repeat the question. How could we expand this and get more comprehensive programs uh, doing more than just dispensing magnifiers? <clears throat> uh, that's certainly something that Bob and I have been advocating and, and talking about for a long time. We both work with the Low Vision Rehabilitation Committee at the American Academy of Ophthalmology. So uh, at the Academy, we have publications and we have courses and we, we try to do that to try to increase awareness. But the real key I think to it was getting <clears throat> Medicare reimbursement for occupational therapy, for example, to do the training uh, for the, these patients. Um, I'll break my arm patting my back in. With, through the American Academy of Ophthalmology, we did a lot of work on the Low Vision Rehab Committee to get that coverage through. And uh, there's no reason to not do it now because you can make money doing it. And there's occupational therapists that are, are, are trained in this. There's two uh, postgraduate programs that give vision rehabilitation training, one in Philadelphia and one in um, uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And they're first class and you get therapists that are coming out that are well-trained. So I would say it's really appropriate for any retinal practice to adding an optometrist, heaven forbid, an optometrist, one of our rival you know, professionals there, and some occupational therapists to a low vision service. That would, because that's where the bulk of the patients are. They're going to be going through retinal offices. And so that, that's a model that, that, that I've used. I've, I'm a retina trained doctor, so it was easy for me to preach that. But I've had a number of, I've introduced a number of low vision practices into retinal practice. So the model that I would see as being really effective is for retina docs to become more involved in it and employ an optometrist and some occupational therapist. You could get a lot of good with that. If you've got more money than you know what to do with, then do a clinic like I've got in Wichita. We've got, I think, 7,000 square feet in our low vision clinic. It's a five-story building. And it's the Taj Mahal of low vision clinics. And we have a lot of money. And that's why I'm in Wichita. So the answer to that question is also, we have an occupational therapist that works in our program that goes out. We have a new one starting in May. Casey is also used the FK reading, the M&M reading. He's the occupational therapist that goes to someone's home after they've had a history of low vision here. Uh, Dr. Olson in the chat says, Don, fascinating and important lecture. Many thanks for taking us through a too often neglected area in our, in our field. Uh, Therese Long, what should we tell our patients in preparation to help them get the most out of their low vision visits? I often ask them to think about the tasks they have the most difficulty with and or the tasks that are important to them that they are not, a, not a, unable to do. Anything else? That's a really good question. I, I hope your voice came across on that. What, what should people tell their patients as they go to a low vision clinic? I notice a huge difference in the mindset of people that get a positive note from a positive message from their doctor. Um, if you tell the person that they're legally blind and that well, there's nothing else I can do, but you might as well go see the low vision clinic guy, that's a real negative referral and they're not gonna have very high expectations. If on the other hand, you say, hey, we've got this great occupational therapist in our clinic here and a good low vision program, and they'll be able to do a lot of good. And I think you've got really good potential to be able to use your vision better with some of the training and devices we've got. So I'd really like you to go and see this because this is, this is the best thing I think we can do for you right now. We can't do any more injections or treatments or lasers or whatever. And so setting the stage for success is great. And telling somebody they're legally blind, that's like telling somebody that's in the hospital that they're legally dead. You're, you're not blind. I hate that term with a passion. Talk about a negative label. So you find, oh, you're legally blind, but go see the low vision clinic. You know, I'm blind. Why should I should bother going? You know, so setting the stage with a positive message of encouragement and hope is the most important thing that a referring doctor can do. IMHO. <laughs>
John, thank you so much. It's been wonderful Thanks. having you here. Thank you so much.